Hi guys, it's week 9, it's embryology time. We're going to talk about some important stuff today, differentiation of the lateral plate mesoderm and the paraxial mesoderm. Very important stuff. It's the spring of 2021. I know it's Memorial Day, but we still, the law says I still have to give you this lecture, so here it is. So remember where we've been. This is a axial view kind of from the head to the tail view of the trilaminar disc. And mesoderm is the star of the show. Remember we have, you formed the three germ layers, the magic stem cell layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. On the bottom, we have a secondary yolk sac right down here. We have an amniotic cavity up here. And what else do we need to say? We have a nodal cord through this cut. There's also a neural tube that's uh, been formed, we talked about. Maybe not at this point. Then, then we talked about that last week, the uh, formation of the neural tube that's forming at the same time. We're kind of backing up to do this story. And last week we said because of BMP, we formed three different regions of mesoderm. Uh, the cells of this mesoderm closest to the midline formed something called the paraxial mesoderm. These cells were exposed to very low levels of BMP and expressed low levels of BMP. Cells farthest out laterally on both sides expressed high levels of BMP and were exposed to high levels of BMP. And that's called lateral plate mesoderm. And the cells right in the middle inter are, are expressed and were exposed to intermediate levels, kind of medium levels of BMP. And that caused that region to morph into what's called the intermediate mesoderm. Now there's going to be further development of these layers. So we're going to talk about lateral plate mesoderm first and then, importantly, paraxial mesoderm second. All right, so that's where we have been. So let's talk about more differentiation, more development, more maturation of lateral plate mesoderm. So it's called lateral plate mesoderm. There's some AKAs. More Moore's Chiropractic Board book calls it lateral intraembryonic mesoderm. Um, there's really no need to do that. We do have an extraembryonic mesoderm, uh, but it, it's, there's, it's not lateral extraembryonic mesoderm. Um, so you can call it lateral plate mesoderm to differentiate it from the extraembryonic mesoderm. And some people just call it uh, lateral mesoderm. It starts forming about day 17, and it will form lateral to the intermediate mesoderm. Okay. It forms on both sides of the body, of course. It does not segment, though. We'll talk about paraxial mesoderm, how it segments. It doesn't clump, uh, but it does split. We'll see how that works in a minute. Splits into two layers. Um, there it is. We've already looked at it there. Lateral plate mesoderm. That's what we're talking about. Um, how does it form? Um, well, we, we said this already. I guess I kind of did the review on this. Remember that, again, uh, the lateral region of the ectoderm releases high levels of BMP which soak into the mesoderm cells below. And the high levels of BMP BMP exposure cause it to morph into lateral plate mesoderm cells. Can be classified into cranial and caudal divisions. Yeah, it does it does divide into two subtypes. One more toward the head, one more toward the tail. So one more cranially, or some authors say anteriorly, which we've explained that confusion before. And one caudally or posteriorly. The dividing line is would be about the fifth somite, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, and it's not a physical, observable division point. It's just uh, based on uh, which genes are turned on. Okay, and so why did I mention the cranium caudal divisions? Because they form different stuff. And remember I said boards and my test and all professors love to test you on what this stuff turns into in the adult. And so the cranial region of lateral plate mesoderm in general uh, forms things like the heart 
and the dorsolateral neck muscles, while the caudal mesoderm cells go on to morph into uh, upper and lower extremity. It, they have limb forming potential. It's not all to it. I mean, it's not, they don't completely form the limbs, but they form a good chunk of them, the bone and stuff like that. Lateral plate mesoderm also forms everywhere some very important cavities. So about day 20, the story, the cavity story began. So let's go down that road. So about day 20, um, it's the mesoderm starts to get holes in it, very similar to the extra embryonic mesoderm, how that got holes in it. And those holes co coalesced into one big gigantic hole called the chorionic cavity. Same kind of story here. So you start to get these little holes in our in our pretty mesoderm, and those holes are called coelomic spaces or coelomic vesicles. Um, Larson calls them, if you're a European student, uh, intercellular clefts. And we'll go with um, Moore's as the board book, of course. For chiropractors, we'll call them uh, coelomic spaces. And so there's what happens first. Because our job now is to split this. We're basically, let me show you where we're going. We're basically going to split. See how we have these layers? <coughs> Remember we talked, sorry, it's morning and my allergies are. It's morning for me. This is my life. Um, we've talked about this. This is the chorionic cavity here. And we we split the extra embryonic mesoderm into these two parts. Uh, so this was the somatic extraembryonic mesoderm, uh, and this was the splanchnic extraembryonic mesoderm. Remember that one chiropractor board book calls this the uh, parietal layer, parietal mesoderm, or parietal extraembryonic mesoderm, and this the visceral mesoderm or visceral extraembryonic mesoderm. And I know I hear you whining, and it's not my fault. Don't. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just giving you a very thorough understanding of embryology, and the authors are confused themselves amongst themselves. So we have all these darn AKAs. But anyway, it'd be nice to split this and keep this right on going, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to con continue on down uh, and create a parietal lateral plate mesoderm and a visceral lateral plate mesoderm. And here's the AKAs. Um, you could call this somatic lateral plate mesoderm or splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm. And to do that, we need to basically just make a cavity out of this. All right, so that's where we're going. All right, so there's the beetles there. They come together, and that's what the coelomic uh, little cavities do. They coalesce together into a new big cavity called the intraembryonic coelom intraembryonic coelom, and there's that darn Langman calls it the embryonic body cavity. So watch out for boards, you chiropractors. It could well be called embryonic body cavity. Most of the authors call it the intraembryonic coelom. Intra um, about, just a side note, we'll talk about this next week, but folding starts, because right now we have a flat, a flat little disc. We need to fold that into, because we're not flat, are we? We're round, so we need to fold the flat disc into a tube. So f right about now, when this intraembryonic coelom forms, um, folding starts about the same time. All right, so now we have a nice intraembryonic coelom going on there. Um, what's next? So this intraembryonic coelom is very important. Uh, about the second month, what's left of this embryonic coelom uh, will fold and create three very important cavities. The pleural cavity, the big P cavities, I call them. I talk about this in fifth quarter constantly. The pleural cavity, that surrounds the heart. It's a little thin cavity that surrounds this, the heart between the parietal and the visceral, the visceral layers. Pleural cavity. So a pericardial cavity, a pleural cavity surrounds the lungs. And a peritoneal cavity, some call it peritoneal. I like peritoneal. Tomatoes, tomatoes. Peritoneal cavity, which surrounds the intestines and organs. And that's basically your belly where all your intestines are 
inside the peritoneal cavity. We'll get to that in depth in fifth quarter. All right, that's enough about that. And then what happens next is our cavity communicates with the chorionic cavity, as I already kind of showed you. And it kind of rips through, and so there is no more cavity. It's just a continuation of the uh, the chori chorionic cavity. And you ha we have, for a while, we have a temporary communication uh, with that chorionic cavity. Remember the AKA for the chorionic cavity is the extraembryonic coelom. Um, so our new cavity that we just created is called the intraembryonic coelom. Um, it's still called that, right? It's that's what it's called when it's a cavity. The important thing is we have a con we have a continuous cavity there, and we've created the important thing is we've created two new layers, as I just said. And just again to remind you, uh, back in this view, back when we were a bilaminar disc. Remember, we had extraembryonic mesoderm hammered pink, and we the same mechanism occurred out here where we split it with this uh, with this chorionic cavity or extraembryonic coelom, and it's basically this same thing goes. It'll uh, lateral plate mesoderm will be right here. It basically splits right into here. There's another way you can look at this. Be something like that. All right, so there we go. Embryonic coelom is now open. Uh, the embryonic coelom meets the extra embryonic coelom, you could say. Is that true? That's a true question. Or you got to know your AKAs. Extra embryonic coelom, or the intra embryonic coelom meets the chorionic cavity. That's true. And there I just drew in the visceral mesoderm here. Um, and this would be a parietal mesoderm. Or you can use the full name, extra embryonic somatic mesoderm, extraembryonic, splanchnic mesoderm. All right, so two new layers have been created, as we said. Uh, so we, this top layer is called the, right here, so this pink layer. Um, that takes the name parietal. You could use parietal. Parietal lateral plate mesoderm is one AKA for it. Or you could do the full name. This could be the somatic lateral plate mesoderm. You shouldn't really call it the somatic intraembryonic lateral plate mesoderm. You could, but that's going too far because there's only one lateral plate mesoderm. So um, this one uh, would be the splanchnic. Splanchnic means inside layer. So splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm or the full name extraembryonic splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm. I know, I hear you, it's confusing. Um, we'll look at the so, the concept of the somatopleur here uh, in a second, and the splanchnopleur. Those are combinations. We'll look at that on pictures, the best way to show you that. Um, but you can read that. Let's just go look at it now. So here it is again. So there's your full name. You could call it somatic lateral plate mesoderm, splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm. Got it? What does the splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm connect to? Well, it connects to the splanchnic extraembryonic mesoderm. And then remember your AKAs. This is also uh, the on the visceral layer. This is this is you could also call this visceral lateral plate mesoderm, parietal lateral plate mesoderm. And some call this visceral extraembryonic mesoderm. And parietal extraembryonic. Oh, sorry, parietal, the parents on top. Parietal extraembryonic mesoderm, visceral extraembryonic mesoderm. All right, here's the concept of the somatopleur. Somatopleur is nothing but, but parietal lateral plate mesoderm in combination with the ectoderm above. So those two layers make up the somatopleur. And the visceral lateral plate mesoderm combines with the splanchnopleur right here, or combines with the endoderm to form the splanchnopleur. See how that works? All right. Yep, AKA City, we just went through. Yep, the monkeys 
or the orangutan is that? It's confused. I'm confused. Everybody's confused with these AKs. Come on. Come on, embryology authors. You need to have a summit, get together, and just name these things and get rid of all these AKAs. But that's never going to happen, but it sure would be nice. So we have somatic lateral plate mesodermis, splanchnic lateral plate mesodermis, we've already said, um, a strong AKA. Um, some call it just somatic mesoderm. That's not a good thing to do, though, because that gets confusing with extra embryonic mesoderm and uh, parietal mesoderm. That um, is not good either. Unfortunately, Moore calls it, calls it that because that can get confused with extra embryonic mesoderm. That you, you should call it parietal lateral plate mesoderm is more uh, correct. Like this one, parietal lateral plate mesoderm. Um, so I, I don't, I'm just going to call it um, either, as I've already said, either somatic lateral plate mesoderm or parietal lateral plate mesoderm. Splanchnic lateral plate mesoderm or visceral lateral plate mesoderm is what I'm going to call it. But just be aware that more the other chiropractic board book, they leave off the lateral plate. Um, and that's that's confusing. They shouldn't do that because of what I just said. All right. After folding, what do these things form in general? So the somatic lateral plate mesoderm, kind of the outer layer, that's going to make your lateral and ventral body walls. It doesn't make the ribs, uh, but it makes the mesenchyme of the rib buds. And that'll make more sense as you continue continue to study embryology. So kind of the outside lateral plate mesoderm gives rise to the um this is just in general there's other things we'll get into but in general think body wall uh splanchnic the inner part of the lateral plate mesoderm folds that's going to make your very important gut tube your entire gut tube which is your uh, your esophagus your stomach your small bowel your large bowel and your rectum uh, so it gives rise to that whole tube it also forms mesentery, uh, and the tube, I mean, part of the tube is the digest digestive tract walls. It gives rise to that as well. Right, there's a lateral, there's a folding video. I didn't used to get to folding. Remember, I cut out oogenesis this time around. Let that, let others teach that. Um, so I used to put this, here's an older folding video, but we'll actually do this for real like to think a little better than I did it a year or so ago. Um, so yeah, lateral f once lateral folding begins, uh, the lateral plate mesoderm differentiates uh, into these uh, two things, and we'll talk about that. But um, should I? No, I won't go through that now. We'll we'll get to well. well let me just real quickly. I should kind of give you a little taste because now we can see the flat. Remember this was this used to be flat like this. This red layer. There's the blue layer was flat and this was flat. And see how it's folding now? And here's the here is our parietal lateral plate mesoderm. But look at our our visceral lateral plate mesoderm. See how it folds way down like that? So that's gonna eventually form this tube right here. It pinches together, but we'll get to that. All right, let's kind of, kind of take a time out from this, this lateral plate mesoderm, because really, I mean, we've just told the story. We've we've split it into the two layers, and that was the story, of the development of lateral plate mesoderm. But let's talk about. Remember the anterior migrators. So we we've we've had a first group of. As the mesoderm is forming, we said epiblast cells are diving through the primitive streak and primitive node. Some of them go straight forward. The first group formed the precordal plate. The sep second group of straight forward migrators in the midline uh, formed the nodal cord. And now we have a third wave uh, that's going to form. Uh, this happens about week three. Uh, and these are a special group of epiblast cells. We won't talk about this, the genes that are turned on in these cells that make them do this. Um, but it's kind of strange because all the other ones went through the primitive node. These don't. They spare the primitive node and they go through the primitive streak, through the caudal, middle portion, and anterior portion of the primitive streak, but they don't go through the primitive node, as it says right there. 
And these are very important because they form the heart, uh, which starts out as a cardiogenic area. Um, so they morph into uh, mesenchymal cells, just like we've described before, and they go through the streak. Um, they stay a little bit lateral to the nodal cord and precordal plate, and they go above that and form basically this little shield right here. Um, and that's known as the cardiogenic area, and that's going to morph into the heart. And we're in the mesoderm, we're, we're below this kind of a see-through view, the ectoderm in green here. Uh, we're looking beneath that because the nodal cord is beneath that as well. Okay, um, So yeah, they, they uh, arrive and they form the cardiogenic mesoderm, which but morphs into the cardiogenic area. And that gives rise to the heart and the great vessels uh, that come off the top of the heart. And it looks like a horseshoe. Sometimes it's called the cardiac crescent because it looks like that horseshoe. And it does surround the precordal plate, as we can see. So there's the precordal plate. Um, and here's this cardiogenic area that formed. Um, so that's all there is to that. We won't get into the heart yet. And you're probably going to be on that one because, I, as I said, I need way more time to, to go through. I already give you guys enough slides. Don't have enough time to form all this stuff. But the cardiogenic area, um, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> cells passing through specifically what part of the primitive streak gives rise to the cardiogenic area in the different parts of the heart. Cells that pass through the cranial region of the streak give rise to the great vessels. Who are the great vessels? Superior vena cava, ascending aorta, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary veins. So the inferior vena cava is often not described as a great vessel, and I'm not sure why that is. But we're leaving it off because it's not a great vessel. Cells passing through the middle part of the streak form the heart's ventricles, right and left ventricles. Cells part passing through the caudal region of the primitive streak give rise to the heart's atria. Right? So here's, you should know this <coughs> from gross one. Mama Z should have had you start memorizing. You definitely have to know it in gross two, but you better memorize it. So here's a just a cartoon view of the heart. Right atria, left atria, four chambers. Right ventricle, left ventricle. Blood comes into the right atria, passes through the tricuspid valve into the left or into the right ventricle. Ventricular systole occurs and shoots the blood out the pulmonary trunk through the pulmonic valve right here, and then it goes through the pulmonary arteries. What's weird about that? It's deoxygenated blood going through arteries. Goes into the lungs, picks up oxygen comes back in f four vessels, two on each side. These are called pulmonary veins. What's weird about them? They have oxygen. There's an example of veins that have oxygenated blood. They dump into the left atrium. Uh, atrial systole occurs. The left ventricles are passively filled by pressure differences, but to top them off and to get full filling of the ventricles, you, there is an atrial systole as well. And you'll get this in physiology if you don't already know it. Powerful mitral valves. We never call these the bicuspid valves when we talk about pathology. Then ventricular systole occurs again. At the same time, the right and ventricles are both emptied. But we're kind of talking about our story here. The left ventricles inject blood up the ascending aorta here. And there's the aortic arch. And that this is these are great vessels, right? All these are great vessels. And the story is told. Brachiocephalic trunk here. Uh, left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. You need to know all those. For I mean, when I taught lab, I used to make you guys know those. Um, okay, so that's that. And here's where we were, just showing how the different uh, heart is formed. Uh, the different cells moving through the primitive streak form the cardiogenic area. So we we can trace these cells that come out of the out uh, the cells that come out of the cranial end <coughs> not the not the primitive node remember the primitive node is right up here so this form the outflow tract ventricles and atrium as we said okay another we have a fourth wave of anterior migrators and a lot of authors don't talk about this but it's important because this forms the diaphragm so uh, about day 22 or so this starts a fourth wave of mesenchymal tissue moves cranially, stays a little bit laterally because it's getting kind of busy there in the middle, uh, but it goes above the cardiogenic area. 
a no the primitive streak is almost completely degenerated so it's the last little bit of the this is one of the last thing the primitive streak uh, gives rise to or, or induces means to give rise to and this wave of cells goes all the way cranial uh, even further than the cardiogenic area so of the four waves that move anterior uh, this wave that forms the diaphragm the diaphragm the rudimentary diaphragm is called the septum transversum septum transversum goes way up front and they pile up and form a, a thick bar and that bar is known as the septum transversum or the primitive diaphragm and so here's what all the stuff we formed the precordial plate then we formed the cardiogenic area and then we formed the septum transversum which is going to uh, become the diaphragm all right <clears throat> we'll form a separate so the diaphragm what does it do uh, it separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity that's very uh, very important gives rise to the diaphragm it also super importantly gives rise to the liver and you wouldn't think that would be so but it does um, the genes in the septum transversum, some genes that produce BMP4 and WENT turn on. So that's part of that story to make some of it morph into the liver. Um, so that's a little weird. The liver actually arises from the primitive diaphragm, which is called the septum transversum. Make a note card of that. There's the diaphragm. You'll study that in gross too, but it's like a dome. Remember when you take a take a deep breath in this contracts and pulls the lungs down and that creates a negative pressure inside the lungs and it sucks air inside the inside the lungs when you breathe out you relax the diaphragm and air is pushed out vital for respiration okay so metogenesis that is where we're heading <coughs> we're going to form somites um, but but really before, I mean, it's a little premature to say somatogenesis. But um, no, it's not because we are going to talk about it. I was thinking that's next week. But yeah, so we need to segment the paraxial mesoderm and form somites. That's right. So let's talk about that. Somatogenesis is next. <coughs> There's where we are. We already know that story. We just talked about how we split the lateral plate mesoderm but another story is going on this paraxial mesoderm is clumping into units uh, paraxial mesoderm uh, where does it uh, where does it form it forms everywhere um, it's in the cranial region it's in the it's in the occipital region it's in the cervical region it's in the trunk remember the trunk embryologists use the word trunk to mean thoracic lumbar sacrum and coccyx why they do that I have no idea it's always confusing um, so yeah so clumping of this paraxial mesoderm into segments is called uh, segmentation so it's a very important process of embryogenesis no segmentation no life you have to you have to have this segmentation occur of the paraxial mesoderm and it basically clumps into blocks of epith back to epithelial structures where some of them like the somites you can see with a microscope they're very very visible um, and the ones in the crani cranial region are called somitomeres uh, and the rest of them are called somites so when I went to school there's only somites but there are somitomeres now and they've been around for a long time so how does this clumping story so the entire paraxial mesoderm I mean right at, we already said mesoderm runs all the way down to the tail down or down to the coccyx all the way up into the skull um, th it starts up here so way up cranially the very first kind of block of paraxial mesoderm clumps about day 19 into really visible structures and those are the first pairs of somitomeres are born right um, in order to clump because we have mesenchymal tissue this is mesoderm we're talking about now right we're not talking about endoderm or ectoderm this is mesoderm so the mesoderm is mesenchymal so um, it used to be epidermal we turned it into mesenchyme now we're turning it back into epithelial so this is called mesenchymal 
to epidermal conversion. Um, so we're clumping it together, and the first somatomeres are born. And we won't go into the genes. I thought did I take um, I thought I talked about that last quarter, but I must have taken the slides out. It's going too far into the weeds. Maybe we'll talk about it next week, though. Um, but this process is called epithelialization. Epithelialization is what Langman calls it. Uh, European, uh, the big authors call it segmentation, which w makes way more sense. Why Langman goes off? Langman goes off in these terms. I don't know why. Just makes it confusing for people who study this. Uh, but AKA is segmentation. Um, so after the first pair of these are made, uh, almost immediately another pair of somatomeres forms just caudal to the first pair. And so then we have pair two of the somatomeres formed. And the process forms again. And there's a wave front of, you can watch that YouTube video if you want to get into it. I don't know why I took those out this quarter, but probably shouldn't have, but I did. Uh, anyway, the second pair forms. And then the third pair, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth. And once the seventh pair forms, we're done with somatomeres. Right? So um, here's just from a side view. This is a, a more mature uh, uh, embryo here, but first seven ones are called somatomeres, right? And again, the first pair develop in the occipital region about the day 20. They go through mesenchymal to epithelial conversion, just to recap. Um, and then a second pair, and a third, and a fourth, and they, they, they don't all develop. The point is they don't all develop at the same time. They develop one after another from a cranial to caudal direction. All right? Now, after the seventh pair forms, another pair forms, but this one is very strongly clumped. You can easily see it under a nice uh, light microscope. And this would be the first pair of somites has formed. And then another pair forms more caudally, and another, and another, and another, and it goes on and on and on. And you can see with a nice uh, microscope here. So mirrors are a little, are up in here, they're a little harder to see. But you can certainly see the first somite is formed right about there. See how clear that is? And there's another one, and another one, and another one. And this, remember, this is underneath the ectoderm this is happening. This is in mesoderm. Or, or they're, they're so clumpy, they push right up through the, uh, and bow the endoderm up. But they are underneath that. And so, um, yeah, so... Yeah, two, so new pairs of uh, somites develop. About three new pairs develop every day. And uh, yeah, they just keep developing, developing. There's a pre-somitic zone where certain chemicals, arachnidinic acid is involved. I won't test you on that because I didn't put the slides in. But there's some. There's a wave front. There's a kind of a chemical gradient of arachnidinic acid as part of the story, if I remember correctly. But we won't test you on that. All right, this this area right here where the next somite will form is called the presomitic zone, or the presomitic area. All right, it's important to know that the somatomeres and the somites develop in a cranial to caudal direction. That's important to know that. All right, so here we go. There's the somites forming. Now the story is, remember the neural tube? That's going on at the same time. The neural pores are closing about the same rate that these somites are forming. So that story is going on at the same time. What's the result of all this epithelialization or segmentation? Uh, well, and this is controversial. Of course, everything's controversial in embryology. By the end of the fifth week, uh, we have about 43 somites that have been formed. Uh, some authors, like Langman says, the first pair of occipital somites actually disappear. Uh, and a few of the coccygeal somites disappear. So according to, uh, for chiropractors anyway, Langman, the final count of uh, somites is 38 pairs of somites will form. Uh, so 38 pairs here. All right, so what's the final count? Um, so we have seven pairs of somatomeres. We have four pairs of somites in the occipital region. We have eight pairs 
of somites in the cervical region, 12 pairs in the thoracic region. Those are familiar numbers. Five pairs in the lumbar region, five pairs in the sacral region. Uh, anywhere from two to ten pairs. It can be variable here uh, for the coccygeal region. Okay, so more importantly, what do somites give rise to in general? This is a very important slide, so you've got to make a note card out of this slide. Um, so they ultimately give rise to the axial skeleton in general. That's a huge deal, right? I mean, that's the whole star of spinal anatomy is the axial skeleton. So the skull, not all the skull, uh, because uh, we have um, other other tissue. Other there's, uh, there's a little more to the skull story. In fact, we talked about neural crest cells, how neural crest cells actually form a part of the occiput. And there's other things that neural crest cells help. But most of the skull is formed um, by somites. The muscles of the axial skeleton, that's a big one. Um, not all of them, but most of them. Most of the dermis, the dura, all of the dura mater, most of the dura mater. <coughs> and then blood vessels. Um, so, yeah, remember the axial skeleton is in blue here. Everything else is the appendicular skeleton. Uh, includes auditory and ossicles and hyoid. Uh, so let's go into the weeds a little bit now uh, and look at one somite. Because, of course, after the somites, or while they're being formed, the somites go into three segmentations themselves. They form three clumped regions as well. So we need to talk about what happens. Somite differentiation. So we have a somite, a block of tissue, the very first thing that happens is a hole forms in the middle of the block of tissue. It's like circling the wagon. This is the big somite, and uh, we're going to make a hole, uh, and that's called the somito seal. The somito seal. To do that, these we have to have first these cells form. So the very first thing that forms are a, 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 like a circle of wagons here. Somito seal cells form. That's the first thing that happens. So middle field, seal cells kind of make a circle. Then the tissue in the middle uh, of the circled wagons disappears and forms a hole. And so the somite now is like a donut. It's got a little hole in the center, and that's called the somito seal. Somito seal. Somito seal cells are super important to chiropractors uh, because they form some really important stuff. They form the annulus fibrosis of the disc. What formed the nucleus propulsus or helped formed most of the nucleus propulsus? Notochord. Um, so, so, middle, so these somatocell cells, they form the annulus fibrosus, um, and they also form the articular surface, the facets of the superior and inferior articular processes of the Z-joint. So some very, very important stuff uh, these somatocell cells form. So here we go. Here's our kind of our head-on view, our cranial to to caudal view or axial view, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we can see we have our neural tube, we have a nodal cord still hanging around, and here is our here is a cut through a somite, and we can see, yep, yeah, we got a, a hole formed right in the middle of the somite, and surrounded by somatocell cells. Got it. Okay, what happens next? So let's meet the sclerotome. That's a very important word. Let's meet that next. So now uh, the, the ventral medial part in that, talking about that same view, the ventral medial part of the somite undergoes a change. And specifically, uh, there are two signaling molecules that soak into this ventral medial part uh, which come from the nodal cord and the neural tube. Um, and these soak into the ventral medial part, and they turn on two genes. Uh, the PAX1 and the PAX9 gene are turned on. Very important genes. 19. PAX1 and 9, they produce gene products. I think that's all the deeper we're going to go. Uh, but they cause that ventral medial portion of the somite and remember, this is we're still mesoderm. This is still mesoderm tissue. Um, surprisingly, they turn, they cause this tissue to go back into mesenchymal tissue. 
So that's like crazy, right? We started with mesenchymal tissue to make a somite. We turned into epithelial tissue, and now we're going back into meso uh, mesenchymal tissue. So it has the ability to move. Uh, so that's an example, really, of mesenchymal to epithelial to mesal transform or mesenchymal transformation. But now it's getting ridiculous. So they're going to cause it called uh, these cells uh, secondary mesenchymal cells because they've already been mesenchymal converted into epithelial and now back into mesenchymal. All right, so we have, uh, bottom line, this dorsal medial portion of the somite um, is a secondary mesenchymal tissue, and that means it's going to move, and that's a good thing because it's ultimately going to move, surround the neural tube, and form our spine, form our vertebrae. So it's really, really important tissue. Okay. So yeah, so this new, these new secondary mesenchymal cells get a new name. They're called sclerotome cells. And this region is now known as the sclerotome. So let's see what happens. So um, you can see our beautiful clumped somite. A third of it is now turned back into cells that have the ability to move. And so these cells, the, the cell's more medial, but technically it's dorsal medial in this view, um, there's your sclerotome cells, and they can move because they're, sec they're mesenchymal cells. See how that works? This is still epithelial. This is all clumped together. Okay, and, and these guys are going to go do the same thing here in a minute, but we'll get to that. All right, what happens next? Or what do they become? More importantly, this is really important. So what do sclerotome cells become? Um, well, first let's tell you what the, another thing they do. Um, they produce two substances that you guys know already, glycosaminoglycans uh, and chondroitin sulfate. Or they, they produce chondroitin sulfate, which is a glycosaminoglycan. It's a gag. So um, the genes for chondroitin sulfate, um, both chondroitin sulfates turn on, uh, and the gene that makes core proteins turns on. So we can actually make a proteoglycan now. So bottom line, sclerotome cells, early sclerotome cells start pro producing uh, proteoglycans, which kind of surround them. Okay, we know all about those from spinal anatomy. And now the proteoglycan encased sclerotome cells move over uh, around the nodal cord, or around the neural tube, and they can support other cells called osteoblasts uh, move into the area and get stuck and kind of embed themselves. They love to be in this proteoglycan gel. Uh, and they hang out there and they turn into bone. <clears throat> so bottom line, sclerotomes make most of the vertebrae and they make the ribs. Okay, we said sclerotome cells kind of migrate and surround the nodal cord and neural tube. Uh, both of those structures to make vertebrae and ribs. All right, fibroblast and chondrocytes are also created from sclerotome cells. Some sclerotome cells don't turn into bone, or they do, they don't support osteoblasts. Um, some morph into fibroblast and chondrocytes. Therefore, they give rise to the meninges. Uh, the dura arachnoid and pia comes from sclerotome cells. Now, what if the question is less deep? It's more general question. So you got to start thinking like this. Uh, so meninges arise from ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm. Well, they arise from sclerotome cells. No, but what are sclerotome cells come from? They come from somites. What do somites come from? They come from mesoderm. So you see how that works? The, de the questions might have different levels of depth, so you have to understand where... All this stuff comes from so meninges come from uh, from mesoderm vertebrae come from mesoderm ribs come from mesoderm but you could go deeper you could say they come from somites that's true you could go deeper you could say vertebrae and ribs uh, come from sclerotome cells and that's that's about as deep as you can go see how that works okay let's go back to our somite so we have a third of our somite is now mesenchymal tissue, but 
two-thirds of it is epithelial tissue, and we can't have that, can we? <clears throat> so let's go back to the story. Let's talk about a new layer called the derma, uh, dermomyotome. I, I like to say dermatomyotome, but it's dermomyotome. So next, the dorsolateral part of the somite cells are stimulated by the gene product WENT. Uh, WENT turns on parac uh, PAX3, 7, and paraxis gene. And with those three genes on, they're going to morph into um, something different. But this is a little strange setup. Uh, PAX3, 7, and paraxis are only turned on at the extreme ends of the part of the somite that is still epidermal. Let's look at a picture here. So this is where these genes are turned on. So we have sclerotome cells here. We've talked about them already. And so this was all epithelial tissue. But the genes at the ends of the two-thirds remaining, they're the ones that are going to turn mesenchymal. right? This whole structure uh, is called the dermomyotome. But we're going to change that real quickly. I think I kind of jumped ahead to show you that picture. So only the extreme ends of the, uh, of the epithelial cells that are left, uh, the PAX3, 7, and paraxis genes get turned on. And, um, yep, they go through those genes, cause another transformation, epithelial to mesenchymal. So the ends of that region become mesenchymal. Um, and that's actually, we'll see what that becomes in a minute. But right now, that whole region, once they start turning mesenchymal, we have kind of a sandwich, uh, an epithelial sandwich with mesenchymal tissue on the ends and epithelial tissue in the middle. That whole structure is called the dermomyotome. It's kind of short-lived, but we'll show you what happens to that. So there's the short-lived dermomyotome. So what happens to ne what happens next? Well, these are epithelia, or these are mesenchymal, these blue ones. Um, so they have the ability to crawl, and what they're going to do is they are going to crawl right underneath here. So they're going to push these middle region, these, epi uh, these epithelial cells, they're going to push them up this way. And so we're going to form a three-layered sandwich here. All right, so they migrate, they move beneath the epithelial uh, region of the dermomyotome. Um, and as they do, that splits it into th two layers. We have the myotome and the dermatome. Let's see what happened. Uh, so here you can see them migrating underneath. Um, and that creates a new layer of cells. These will be known as the myotome. So we have sclerotome. We've already talked about them. Go on to form the bones, the vertebrae, and ribs. Now we have these new layer called myotome cells, and then these are called dermatome cells, and they stay epithelium. See how that works? And there we're done. The donut hole cells are also migrated. They became epithelial or mesenchymal as well and got the heck out of there. We'll talk about them in a while. But there is a mature somite, which is made of epithelial tissue, and two layers of mesenchymal tissue. And this is not going to stay around forever. It's going to go morph into its structures. But there you see what a mature somite looks like. What are the three layers of the somite? From dorsal to ventral. Dermatotome, right, still epithelium, myotome, and sclerotome. Got it? What does the, uh, in general, what does, um, that give rise to? What does the dermatome give rise to? Uh, well, it's epithelial, so how about the skin? And that's what it gives rise to, mainly. Uh, but not all skin. Uh, the dorsal dermis of the trunk, really the dorsal lateral dermis of the trunk, oh no, dorsal dermis, that's right, of the trunk, um, is formed by, um, and what is the skin, right? That's epidermis and dermis. So, the, dermato, the dermatome cells give rise to the dorsal dermis of the trunk, so basically your back. Um, the central and lateral trunk and the dermis of the limbs comes from lateral plate mesoderma. So watch out for that. Boards do like what the dermis is complicated, how it forms. 
Um, so uh, the dorsal dermis comes from dermatome cells. The lateral and central dermis of the trunk uh, come from lateral plate mesoderm. Um, and then we've already talked about how neural crest cells up in the head region give rise to some of the dermis as well. Um, you could say it comes from mesoderm, make it easier, can't you? Yeah, so most of the dermis does come from mesoderm. Where's the epidermis come from? How about that layer right there? Dermatome. Nope, it doesn't. It comes from epi uh, from the in ect ectoderm cells. We'll get to that. Um, okay, so the central region of the dermatome um, is now gives rise to two. It, it's now known. So I'm not. Is this would I get this from a paper? Um, this is from Carlson. So for Europeans, this might be fair game. Chiropractors don't need to know this, uh, but I mean it's nice to know. So the central region of the dermatome. Um, it gives rise to brown fat and some skeletal muscles, and we'll just leave it at that. All right. Just the histology. Just remember your histology. Uh, so the skin, the word skin, according w chiropractors use uh, chunkira, and the skin is the epidermis and the dermis. It's not the the subdermis or the hypodermis. It's got all that third layer down is not technically the skin. Um, so just remember where the dermis is. Right. So there's the dermis. Stratum basale is the basal layer. The is where all the stem cells are. We'll go through that. Talk about that briefly in dermatology, but Dr. Doe should have talked about how the skin is formed. These are all the keratinocytes in different phases of their lives. All right. Um, what about the somatocell cells, the donut cells? We said they turn mesenchymal too, um, and they did. While somewhere where they're not exactly sure where this occurs, but somewhere after or during the formation um, of when these go through epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. So mesenchymal cells also go through epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. And then they get they get the heck out of the way because this thing is morphing into a three-layered beast. So they move out uh, next to the neural tube. Some authors call these arthrotome cells once they move out of the somite. Now, chiropractic board books still call them somatocell cells. So we'll stay with that. All right, I guess that is enough for your brains, and we will see you again next week. See you later.